Hello, students. So you should have finished watching Flight Through the Ages. If you did not watch that video, you need to go back and watch that video, okay? It's on my YouTube channel. It's also on my Schoology page. We are now going to be going through the worksheet Flight Through the Ages. So you'll need this worksheet. It's downloadable on my Schoology page. You can get it there. Or uh, if you were in school, you should have gotten the worksheet of paper. Um, we'll be completing this worksheet and you'll just snap a picture of it when it's done you'll upload it for those students who are at home uh, you can use cami to complete it so the options are yours on how you'll complete this worksheet but you want to have this worksheet today we're going to cover flight through the ages we're going to go over the video all the points that we saw in there and we're going to uh and i'll be giving you the worksheet answers the correct answers for the worksheet so Let's get on with the PowerPoint. So we're going to move over to that now. And the space shuttle has made contributions in what four areas? There's four areas that the space shuttle made major contributions. So think about what those areas were. Hopefully you picked it up on the video. And we'll go over those. Those are astronomy, engineering, life sciences, and medical research. Okay, so those four areas are the are where the space shuttle made major contributions in astronomy we had to learn all new navigation systems because we couldn't just travel by gps there is no gps in space okay so we had to use astronomy going back to way back when early sailors would be moving across bodies of water they used the stars to travel on boats and in space we use the stars to travel engineering how are we able to sustain life in space and keep an encapsulated area in space that allows us to breathe, eat, uh, do all the functions that we need to do while we're in space safely? Because there's the, uh, um, the lack of atmosphere, uh, so we're in a vacuum, plus solar radiation is huge. So we had to develop these tin cans, these capsules, to hold people in space, in this case, the space shuttle, for longer durations of time. Then we had to learn about life sciences. So with this, we really were concentrating on what happens to our body in space for longer durations. Before this, trips weren't that long in space. And even the longer ones, we didn't have a lot of room to see what happened to our bodies in space. So we were able to take treadmills up into space and do experiments on not experiments but do uh, uh do research on how our body reacts to longer terms in space and then there's medical research so again you know this whole thing how does our body survive the life sciences medical research uh we also think about the lettuce how can we grow stuff in space okay because we're going to be out there for longer time what effects does that have on the the nutrients we're needing while we're in space so those four areas astronomy engineering life sciences and medical research uh those were the space shuttle's real big contributions in what year was the space shuttle first launched number two on your worksheet uh that answer 1984 so the space shuttle was first launched in 1984 and everybody understands right now that the space shuttle is not flying at all okay the space shuttle is done it was moth the fleet's been mothballed um it, it no longer flies the different shuttles are located throughout the country in being either placed into museums or currently in museums and as our display pieces. But the uh, space shuttle has not flown for some quite some time now. Um, but uh, it, again, 1984 was the first launch. What three ingredients did the Chinese mix together to get gunpowder? What three ingredients did they mix together? It was charcoal, sulfur, sulfur and potassium nitrate, KNO2. So these three things, the Chinese incredible dynasty, you know, they were always mixing different stuff together. And do you remember what they talked about in the video? What were they trying to get with it? They were trying to get a medicinal use. So something for medicine, something that we could ingest or use on our skin or, or something to make us feel better. 
and they mix these ingredients together and lo and behold it, it, it was gunpowder so now we start solid fuels okay this is where we had something that was together it gets ignited and boom blows up so let's hope nobody ingested that and then it got near a flame uh, that would be catastrophic to the person but we have a gunpowder with charcoal sulfate sulfur potassium nitrate those are the three things that went into a gunpowder mixture. And again, that's the first start of a solid fuel. Now, they ended up using it in fireworks, finding out that, hey, we can ignite this and boom, stuff can launch. So this is a solid fuel. Newton's third law. Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It's just important to understand that Newton had a few different laws. Third one, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So air thrusts out the back of the balloon, and then the balloon moves forward in the um, opposite direction. Okay, so they have these different uh, ways to, uh, or I'm sorry, air thrusts out the back, and the balloon moves forward. So equal and opposite reaction. Sorry about that. So Robert Goddard, he came along. And he conducted and successfully tested a first rocket made of what? So in 1926, Robert Goddard developed the first rocket and tested the first rocket made of liquid fuel. Liquid fuel. Again, up until this time, primarily used with solid fuel. So with a solid fuel booster or solid fuel rocket, it was packed with a solid ingredient. It was ignited and it kept on burning until there was nothing left, okay? So when all the fuel in the tank was spent, that was it. These boosters were generally like a hollow that was packed with it. They ignited the bottom and it literally just burned out and expelled out. So it was the equal and opposite reaction going out the back, boom, rocket goes forward. No control over these things. Couldn't make them go any longer, couldn't, uh, couldn't make them go shorter. Um, so no real control over it. Now we have a liquid fuel. So Goddard was responsible in 1926 for developing this liquid fuel. Think of it as like gasoline, okay? Except for jet engines uh, or for rocket engines. And this allowed us, okay, if we're going too far, pull off on the gas or stop applying liquid. If we need to get the rocket to go further, add more liquid to it. If we launch the rocket into the wind, the wind's going to push back on the rocket. So the wind's gonna push back on the rocket and the rocket's gonna really come up short of its target or could. So what you have to do is calculate, okay, there's a 10 mile an hour wind that's going against us and we're going at 300 miles per hour. So how much fuel do we need to travel 50 miles? And they have to calculate that very specific. Okay, so boop, and it lands with liquid fuel and through radio and communication, we could have a lot more control over the rocket. So liquid fuel was really a big advancement in 1926. And then Werner von Braun, von Braun. What did he develop? And then whose space program did he eventually help? Well, Von Braun developed the V-2 ballistic missile, and he ended up helping the U.S. space program, okay? So the V-2 ballistic missile, he, uh, Von Braun was German, um, and, you know, worked for Nazi Germany and probably realized that, you know, maybe the Nazis aren't the best people to be working for. So he got out, defected, we kidnapped him, whatever. We were able to go through and get him and bring him in to assist with our U.S. space program, okay? So the V-2 ballistic missile was the first thing that we were able to really launch, and, um, or he was able to, or that was the first thing he was launching, was his development was a V-2 ballistic missile, and this missile, sorry, went from continent, from Germany to London. So across the pond, the channel, okay? So really not that far. The missile rained down holy terror on the European bloc, okay? So um, those co countries in close proximity to Germany were in real trouble, but the V-2 ballistic missile really couldn't hit us in the States. So we were sort of sitting over here comfortable, but this is the precursor. It's a 
ballistic missile, not an intercontinental ballistic missile, but he ended up helping the U.S. space program, okay? So the U.S. space program is whose program he went to help. All right, 1957. So this is a big one. 1957 uh, was the first satellite successfully launched into orbit. So this was the Soviet Union launched uh, Russia, Mother Russia, launched the first satellite in the space. Now, rather small, ping, 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 went out there, wasn't anything big, uh, but it terrorized a lot of pro people because this is now the start of an intercontinental ballistic missile. You got to understand, they put this satellite up on top of this huge rocket that could travel hundreds of miles per hour, and they launched it into space. Was that a nuclear bomb? Was it really, or atomic bomb at that time, conventional bomb? Was it really a satellite? And it, it, it scared the U.S., okay? Um, so this really, it started, the, it really started the space race really going because now they've got a presence in space. They were able to put something in space. And then we're like, man, you know, what, how are we going to counter this? So we developed our space program. But what was really, really scary about this, and not only did it start the space race, it really escalated the Cold War. So as we talk about what is a Cold War, does anybody know what a Cold War is? Has anybody heard the term Cold War? Did you think about it? Have you heard of the term Cold War? Cold War was, was a war where no battles were publicly fought. Now, was there espionage and spy games going on? And were there little things going on that we didn't see as a public? Yes, that stuff's starting to become declassified. But there was no battle. There was no formal like Battle of the Bulge or D-Day or any of those big things that you think of traditionally with a battle. And there was no real public dogfights of, of planes or anything. This was just two superpowers who were now new, who eventually became nuclear superpowers to this with our intercontinental ballistics staring at each other. And why this escalated the Cold War? Before this time, if Russia wanted to launch an attack on us or we wanted to launch an attack on them, we would um, send up our bombers or they would send up their bombers, okay? And you gotta understand that this, the travel time for a bomber back then, 12 hours from Russia to US or US to Russia. So we could see them on radar, we could, sat, we could scramble our fighters, we could send our fighters up against their, their, um, up against their bombers, and we could divert them, and they would turn back, and we would turn back. Or, better yet, they launch, we launch, and we have time to negotiate. Say, what is wrong? Um, it gave a natural pause in any type of battle. So, yes, we say we're going to fight, or they're going to fight us. They launch these bombers, and they're 12 hours away. Well, presidents can get on the phone and they can start talking back and forth to, well, what do you mean by this? And what did you do with this? Wait, I didn't really mean that. And we didn't mean that. And they can negotiate and scale down. And they could, the temperament could go down. With these missiles, with what went on this, uh, the Soviet launch in 1957 and today's missiles, we launch a, they launch a rocket or we launch a rocket. And from time of launch to time strike on the other continent, across an ocean or across the polar caps, 20 minutes. 20 minutes from a rocket to leave Russia and a rocket to hit us. So that meant it only took about 10 minutes to put this satellite into space. That's scary because now we have no warning. There's no warning and there's no time to talk. And just to scale back and to say, wait a minute, let's de-escalate this. What's going on? So now everything is like that. And we're no longer an ocean apart now. We are in each other's backyards. And two superpowers in a Cold War mean that both parties were sitting there with their fingers on the trigger, ready to fire, staring at each other down. And that's big and that's scary. So this, this whole satellite launch and the start of the space race, yes, did it develop a lot of great things for us, but it brought our two countries very close and not in a good way. So tensions were really high. So this escalated the Cold War. 
like to think things are better terms now. Uh, you know, it, it goes up and down. Um, but, you know, we have this technology now, so good or bad, mostly, uh, we have to be mindful of what's happening, and, we ha and words do matter. So this started the space race, this 1957 satellite launch, but it also, it also really escalated the Cold War, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that's uh, the 57 space launch, uh, the 57 satellite launch, Russia. So in 1961, then, the U.S. gets into this, and this is where we're now in the space race. We're, boom, we're there with it. We get our first American into space. Anybody catch who that was? All right, should have been called on the sheet, Alan Shepard, and his flight lasted 15 minutes. So we're down at number eight. His flight lasted 15 minutes. That's it. I'm going to say 15 minutes. That's nothing. That's 15 minutes more than any of us, most of us are going to see in space. Now, I really hope you get a chance. My generation, you know, you can count. Uh, the, the party of people that have been in space is relatively small, okay, when we talk about global population. I really hope you get your chance in space. I will never. Uh, but it would be incredible to see you guys all getting your chance to get to space. Um, will it happen? Who knows? But Alan Shepard really paved the way. So this is a guy, this is a true hero. This is a test pilot. His flight only lasted 15 minutes into space, or space, his, uh, his rocket. Um, and this is a guy who kissed his family and says, hope to see you soon. Science said we could do this. They had research that said we can survive it. But he's putting himself on a big, huge explosive rocket and going out into space and getting back in one piece and when you start to put all these things together that's got to make some people worried alan shepherd he, he took the challenge and he went and his flight was really to test his suit uh how did it work you know uh was it was he able to do this you know that's that's what he was looking at uh, so his flight did that. It was successful. It got him into space. He was able to test his suit. And then he um, went through and uh, 15 minutes later, he was uh, back down to earth. You know, so he understood, you know, we could breathe in space. The suit's going to protect us. Capsule's going to protect us. So did everything he had. First American into space, Alan Shepard, 15 minutes, 1961. Now we get into the moon launch, 1969. And this is huge. Uh, so what rocket took us into space? Did you get this? So that's Apollo 11. Apollo 11 got us into, ro uh, got us into space. And there's many different style rockets along the way. You know, so if we go back to here where we're talking 61, Alan Shepard got into space. Uh, now we're into the Apollo mission, 69. And um, Apollo 11 is what got us to the moon. So they had Apollo missions that took us out there. And these were uh, three men capsules, and uh, they went, they launched, and there's three people in this. Who were the astronauts? Did you get it? Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. Uh, how many of them walked on the moon for the first time? How many people walked on the moon? Two of them? Did you pick up who it was? Or do you know who it was? I don't think the video said. And I have an asterisk there. Neil and Buzz. Uh, these are two people that got a chance to walk on the moon. Now, Michael Collins, unfortunately, this one, never got a chance to walk on the moon with Apollo 11. He had to stay in the command module. So it's two parts. The cone, where they went up, and then they came back down to. But then they also had the lunar excursion module, or the LIM. And that was sort of like, think of the rocket, the, these big, huge rockets that took them out into space. So the lower part of the rocket was the big booster. Fuel and everything gets them off the ground. Then the middle part and almost the top part is almost like a garage. And that's where they had storage. So they would actually have the capsule would leave the front, turn around, go back towards the, the, the rocket body, and then attach and pull out the LEM. And then they took the LEM and went down to the surface. So Michael Collins had to stay up in the uh, command module, but Neil and Buzz got a chance to walk around on the moon. And so that was 1969, Apollo 11 took them to the moon. So 
So now we're into the space plane goals. Okay, now we're into the space plane goals. <coughs> Excuse me. Space plane goals. Three goals. Three goals we had. I know this one's a little bit tricky, so hopefully you didn't write down your stuff when in pencil when I told you to uh, take the watch the video. Um, there's three real goals for this. So the first one was to get to orbit. Then we wanted to sustain life in space. And then we wanted to survive reentry and be reused. And it's like, duh, Mr. Miller, of course we wanted to survive reentry and be reused. Well, obviously, yes, we wanted a plane to get us into orbit. Okay, we wanted to sustain life in space. But what they're talking about, survive reentry and be reused, was no longer the capsule. Every time one of those big, huge capsules came down, the big, huge, the three main capsules came down, they were done. They were, t they were like a piece of toast, okay? You gotta understand these heat shields on the bottom, the thing just burned up and the thing was scorched, literally scorched. So when they landed in the, in the ocean, um, some of them stayed afloat. I mean, the astronauts got out of them and then, you know, the parachute, they land, astronauts get out because they're floating and they get picked up. And then most of them, they were able to pull up and get out of the ocean. I think they lost a couple along the way that sank, but these things were toast, literally toast. They're coming back through our atmosphere and that's friction, okay? Burn these things up. So the capsule never really survived re-entry and couldn't be reused. So with a space plane, they're thinking, okay, what can we develop that we can survive re-entry and then be reused? Okay, so that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Survive re-entry and be reused. Then we have the shuttle fuel types. Now, what were the fuel types that we had? Uh, what were the different fuel types we had? Anybody pick them up? And there was two fuel types, and they also did mention a cooling agent. So it was liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Those were the two fuel types that we had, okay? Liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Those are the two fuel types that we had. The, um, they were stored at several hundred degrees below zero. Some were between 179 and 197 negative uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So we're talking really cold, okay? Um, and this is how they would liquefy it. So oxygen and hydrogen in their raw air forms. Now, oxygen's all around us, but air that we have around us is only about 22%. The rest of it is made up of other gases. So we light a match. The match can sustain and be can burn because there's oxygen. It's one of the uh, three things that are needed to burn uh, for a flame to sustain. But if we were in an environment where we light pure, have oxygen, pure oxygen we just pump oxygen into this room and there's nothing else boom we light that match it's going to explode so what we do is when we compress it and make it nice and cold it compresses we get compressed down we ignite this it's much more controlled yes it's still a big huge explosion okay it's lots of explosions uh so it's a constant big huge burn but it can be very controlled when we do it in that atmosphere, in that uh, setting. So when we liquefy oxygen and hydrogen, mix it together, ignite it, very powerful, but a lot more controlled than in its raw air form, uh, gaseous form. So again, several hundred degrees below zero between negative 170 and 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and liquid nitrogen is what they actually use to cool the engines down liquid nitrogen all right let's move on to shuttle tasks so now we build the space shuttle what did we actually task it with well we gave it really three main tasks the tasks of transporting satellites into space resupplying of the international space station and conducting scientific experiments okay so that's what we're looking at and those were the things that we um that we we're trying to do with these with the space shuttle so you think of the shuttle, think of Apollo missions. Yes, they had these big, huge rockets, but a really, really small garage, okay? They didn't have much transport, so they couldn't do much with it. Yes, they took the lunar excursion module, but that was really a small vehicle. I mean, we're talking like a, like a couple telephone booths. So, you know, I don't even know if you know what a telephone booth is. Um, the size of a minivan, 
you know, we're talking about dropping it onto, not dropping it, placing it back onto the moon. So not a lot of room in this thing. I mean, not even like the size of a minivan. So we got not a lot of room. And the Apollos couldn't lift big stuff. The space shuttle, that's like a tractor trailer compared to the Apollo missions. Apollo missions is like you know, your minivan, carrying something up, boom, letting the kids out and, uh, and taking your stuff out for a picnic. The, the, the space shuttle, that's a heavy lifter. That's taking big satellites into space. We built the International Space Station with the shuttle. With the shuttle. So we're taking up these big, huge components into space where people are living at right now. And we shipped it up there, each one of the modules up there. We used it for resupply of the International Space Station. We take the supplies up and building it. And we used it to conduct scientific experiments. So here now we have, again, we talked early about Apollo. It was very small. We couldn't do like treadmill stuff, breathing exercises to see how our body reacted in space. But the space shuttle, we were able to fold down a treadmill and start doing running in space. How does our body handle multi-day, multi-week missions? You know, we're talking two, maybe a three-week mission thrown in there every so often out of the, you know, hundreds of missions that they, that they flew. Um, or that they launch into space. So uh, these are this is what we're talking about. Conduct scientific experiments, resupply the International Space Station, and transport satellites into space. Now, what's next? Um, we talked about it earlier. The, the shuttle is no longer flying. They have something that's next. What's next is the, is, I'm sorry, the Orion missions, okay? Um, so Orion is what's going to take us out to Mars. Um, and that's a big deal. We're going back to a capsule on these missions. Uh, so we're going to have more of that capsule-based thing. Uh, we're we're going to stuff some people in there. They're going to be bigger crew quarters, okay? But it's not like the reusable, okay? So we have much longer duration missions, and these are the Orion. Now, it was supposed to launch in 2014, like any good government project or any big project of this nature, too. It's delayed. Um, I... I think they're talking 2023 is manned missions. They're doing a lot of testing right now and, and getting some things. So somewhere around 2022, 2023 is where we're going to look at starting to see some manned missions from it. They are launching a po uh, Orion capsules right now, and they're doing testing with them, doing some unmanned stuff, um, a lot of abort testing, uh, that type of things, just to make sure that it works. So they are having some great success with that, but now they're looking uh, to do uh, the bigger stuff with it. In 2022, 2023 is when they're going to look at some man people out there. All right, so this concludes the review of the worksheet Flight Through the Ages. Okay, um, After you answer all the questions in a couple days from now, uh, again, you'll have to turn in this uh, for those of you, if it's if this is done asynchronously, we'll have a method for you to turn it in. There will be directions. Otherwise, uh, you can go back through this video, get the answers, fill it out. Um, so that's it for, t uh, for this lesson. And the next thing will be watching the video on Orion and talking NASA's video on Orion and, and that. So, all right. Thank you for paying attention. Have a great day.